All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's installment of What's Up in Tonight's Sky with me, Bobby Farley's Rubio from the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Uh, it may say Karina Weiss at the bottom of my screen, but that's because we have a shared account with Zoom and uh, she's my director of programs. I'm not Karina Weiss, I'm Bobby Farley's Rubio. But on today's episode of uh, What's Up in Tonight's Sky, I wanted to mention that in just two days, we are having the summer solstice. Now, it feels like summer here. It's 90 outside, and it's been hot for a few days. But while we talk about the summer solstice, we're talking about a very specific thing that is officially called the first day of summer, but really is a measurement of the angle of the sun above the Earth. And, well, remember, in the old days, people thought that the Earth was stationary, and they thought the sun was moving. And the word solstice comes from the word sol in Latin, which means sun, like solar system and sol in Spanish. And also, stis, that part is actually closely related to the word stitch and station. It means stationary or to stop. It's the sun stopped at its particular station, and it seems to stay at that height. And then it slowly starts to sink back down until the winter solstice, which is exactly six months from the summer solstice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but there's also other things going on in the sky that are not just one day, but many days into the future, many nights, uh, including the reunion of Jupiter and Saturn that's going to be happening during this summer. But also there's a very special thing happening just tomorrow morning. And this is going to give you a chance to get up before sunrise and see a beautiful thing you're going to see the moon covering the planet Venus. And while the, the moon is in the sky, before the sun rises, Venus will suddenly become visible right before the sunrise. And it's kind of cool because it'll seem to pop out where the moon is dark in its uh, crescent phase. The moon is in a waning crescent, meaning it'll be up right before sunrise. And Venus is going to be literally right behind the moon from our perspective. And in astronomy, this kind of thing happens occasionally, sometimes rarely. But whenever an object blocks another object in the sky, we call that an occultation. If you've ever heard the word occult, like using your Ouija board to talk to the spirits, occult refers to hidden, like uh, a secret society meeting in a cave, the cult of Mithras was occult, perhaps in ancient Roman times. But occultation in astronomy doesn't have anything to do with secret societies. It literally means the, the simplest definition, occult meaning hidden. And so we're gonna have an occultation, no juju going on, but just a beautiful sight tomorrow morning. And I'm going to use Stellarium to show you all of these things right now. And hopefully before we're done today, I'll also give you a little historical uh, lesson about how the summer solstice, specifically that date that's coming on June 20th this year, led to the discovery in Egypt of the measurement of the entire size of the Earth. This happened 2,200 years ago. And the person who I'll tell you about later was a librarian. And he used shadows and the path and the light and the rays of the sun to figure out the size of the earth. And he was so accurate that his measurement was only off by roughly estimated about 255 miles off of the actual known size of the earth based on today's mo modern observations. And his name was Eratosthenes. We'll talk about him later. but. There is a kid's book that you may want to get out if you're a parent of young kids or you're a young kid yourself and you want to learn about this cool librarian in a fun way. It's a book called The Librarian Who Measured the Earth. And the book has great illustrations and it will give you the story as far as you need to know, but I'll give you some of it here too. But first, let's get into Stellarium. And that is the free software that any of you can download on any kind of computer to use at home to either follow along or maybe use it to plan what you're going to see in tonight's sky. I'm going to open up my Stellarium here. It's available for free at the website stellarium.org. And I've got mine set up right now to show you what it looks like outside. Well, if you've been watching these uh, shows, you may have noticed that uh, I, I always comment on the landscape not matching the outside, but now it actually does. And actually, I have got a question from someone out there in the ether that I didn't see. I haven't gotten a question in a while, but 
So somebody said at 4 a.m. they saw the SpaceX satellite crossing Saturn and Jupiter. Now, there are the Starlink satellites, and those satellites are out there, but uh, mo that's not the only satellites you're likely to see. And luckily, most of those Starlink satellites are very dim, except when they first got launched. So if you remember the videos that people made of those huge trains of bright lights, that was because they were reflecting a lot of sunlight, and they were not yet in their final position. They're a little more dispersed now, but there's so many other satellites that you can see, and you may have seen the International Space Station. So without getting distracted from the rest of the things I'm going to talk about, that the person who asked the question, I want you to know that if you go to NASA's website, spot the station, you can punch in your zip code and look at the list. It shows you not just the future, but also past sightings of the ISS. And it's very possible that you may have seen the International Space Station or one of the many other thousands of satellites out there. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. We already have about 5,000 pieces of human-made stuff floating, orbiting around the Earth. Half of it is junk, half of it is active, and that is already a concern. We're much more responsible about space junk now than we used to be back in the early days of the space race. But um, one of the concerns is that SpaceX's plan with the Starlink mission is to add 12,000 new satellites to the sky, so that will basically triple what we've already got or more than triple what we've already have orbiting the earth and that is where the concern comes because then you might actually have a situation where there are more satellites in your view than actual stars and i don't want to contemplate a fate uh, for humanity like that but i hope that answers your question spot the station at nasa is the one of the best ways and if you want to go into more detail about other satellites there are many apps one i can recommend is called starwalk that is an app you can get on your ipad and it has some of the more uh, large satellites besides the iss and tells you where they are in real time there's lots of information on that but i'm going to get on to stellarium so Keep your eyes up there, and I'm glad for that question. Anybody else wants to ask a question, please uh, feel free and chime in at any time. But here is Stellarium, and I'm going to show you where the sun is. Now, let's think about this for a second when we zoom out. We're close to the solstice, which means the sun is almost as high as it can be in the sky, but this isn't uh, the middle of the day. To get to the middle of the day and to know precisely what I mean by that, I'm going to show you how you can use the sky and viewing options to pull up the markings for the meridian. This is the line that cuts the sky in half. And I'm going to back up time by hitting the J button on my keyboard until I can make the sun hit that line. And you notice the clock is running backwards. What time would the sun be on that line? If you thought noon, you'd be right if this was in the times when noon was calculated with the meridian. But we don't use the sun to calculate time anymore. We have standard time, and we also have daylight savings time. So notice that the sun is actually on that line at 1252. And if I lived in Burlington, 75 miles to the west of here, it would be at a different time. And if I moved uh, you know, to Portland, Maine, it would be at a different time slightly, even though we're in the same time zone. So I think I see somebody with a question. Hold on a second. I'm trying to get to you. Okay, let me see. I'm not sure who was that uh, tried to raise their hand. Uh, I am sort of new to this hosting of uh, classes. So maybe the best way to uh, ask me a question is either the chat function, uh, you can type it there, or the Q&A function, I definitely can see those. So, uh, Jay, let's see. I'm gonna let allow you to talk, Jay, assuming that you're gonna contribute a great question to this discussion. All right, Jay. Not sure if you're there, but I don't see or hear you, so I'm gonna go back. All right, so let's move on. So let's get back to Stellarium. Now, sun on the meridian, well, how high up is the sun? Is it, does it ever get directly overhead? Not for us. 
So in this view, I kind of made this guy chopped up for you. The sun would have to be in the center of this circle for it to be directly overhead. And where we live, uh, that never happens because of our latitude. But if you were to travel south of here to exactly 23 and a half degrees north latitude, which happens to be pretty close to the location of the place where my mother was born in La Habana, Havana, Cuba, in that province of Cuba, in near the big city, Havana, is the Tropic of Cancer. And this is where we get the word tropic. Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. The Capricorn is in the south, the Cancer is in the north. And when the sun is on the Tropic of Cancer line, which I can make visible with our markings too. Let's see, that should be easy to find, Tropic lines. Oh. Hmm, interesting. I have it in my planetarium, but they don't have it apparently here. I'm going to skip that. But let me just tell you that the sun is on the Tropic of Cancer line during the solstice. And during the winter solstice, it's on the Tropic of Capricorn line. And if you live in between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, basically the tropics, then you have the possibility of having the sun directly overhead at least once a year on the solstice or maybe more if you live close to the equator. That happens for those folks all the time. But if you live north of the Tropic of Cancer or south of the Tropic of Capricorn, you will never see the sun directly over your head at the zenith at the top of the sky. So this actually helps you understand what happened to Eratosthenes. And just if you're wondering, those of you who are real sticklers say, hey, it's only June 18th. Well, I'm going to advance time two days. Doot, doot. And even two days later, you can see that the sun did not apparently move. That's because it's the solstice. It looks like the sun is standing still at its highest point. And it will seem to move again starting in July. Then you'll start to notice a little bit lower, but very slight until maybe about by August. Then you'll really notice that the sun is dropping and fall is coming quick. So imagine if you lived like we do in Vermont, north of the Tropic of Cancer, and you're used to never seeing the sun directly overhead. And imagine if you traveled south to a city where the sun could be seen overhead. Well, if let's imagine I hopped on a very fast jet from Vermont to Havana, Cuba. And when I got there, I noticed that the sun was straight up over my head. How would I know this? Well, when it happened to Eratosthenes, he wasn't flying from Vermont to Cuba. He walked or, I don't know, he rode a camel or a donkey, but he traveled the old fashioned way from the city of Alexandria, which is on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt in Africa. He traveled south along the Nile to an area that was known as Nubia, where Nubian goats and Nubian princesses come from. And Nubia, south of Egypt, is in the tropics. It's actually just past the Tropic of Cancer in that region. And they didn't have that name yet, but what Eratosthenes noticed when he got to that city, it was the solstice, and he went to get water. It was probably super hot, desert, and he wanted to get some water in, out of a well. And he looked down into the well, and he saw the sun staring right back at him, reflected in the water at the bottom of the well. Now, Eratosthenes probably went to wells on a daily basis, and he lived in Egypt. He was a librarian at the Library of Alexandria, so he was surrounded by intelligent people and the scrolls that had things like the original Pythagorean theorem and the writings of Euclid and Archimedes. You know, this guy was surrounded by this kind of stuff. He lived and breathed this world of mathematics and science. So when he saw that sun at the bottom of the well, he immediately realized that sun is directly overhead and that can never happen in Alexandria. No days of the year will the sun reflect from the bottom of a well in my hometown, but here in this city called Syene, which is now Aswan, where that famous dam is in Egypt. That's where this happened. He saw it and he said, oh, this city must be directly under the sun and where I live, it must be at a slightly different angle. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. You can look it up yourself. However, what Eratosthenes realized was that the earth was not flat, but instead curved. He realized that Alexandria's wells were pointing in a slightly different direction then Syene's wells, even, and these cities were still within Egypt. They were separated by, by hundreds of miles, enough for him to deduce the curvature of the earth. And instead of 
just showing you that picture in Stellarium. I'm going to show you a little diagram here. Sorry to get a little too didactic, but this is actually a summary of what Eratosthenes figured out. So let's see if I can find this big egghead. This is the only picture I've ever seen of Eratosthenes. Uh, it's from a book, and nobody really knows what he looked like. This picture was made centuries after his death. But if you look at his birth date, 276 BC, before the Common Era, as we would say today, and he died 194 BC. So he died during the ancient Greek Empire, but he he lived in a time, you know, before the Roman Empire, for example, ancient history. And he was born in Libya. But this is what made him famous. Oh, he did make the first armillary sphere, a model of the universe, but notice that the Earth is at the center and the sun and the moon are going around the racetrack that we now know as the Zodiac. He invented those, as far as we know. And he also made a map of the world, at least the world that he knew, and notice the glaring absences in, on this map. You can see Europa, you can see Scythia, which is uh, Russia, roughly, corresponds to that part of the, and the, the Baltic regions, and the Caspian Sea, where Iran is. You can see India, you can see Sri Lanka, you can see Libya, but where is most of Africa? And no, obviously, North America, South America, totally unknown to people in the Mediterranean region at this time, but this is the size of his world. So. He actually made a very small map. This tells you that the stories that he received at the Library of Alexandria could, re could come to him from as far away as India, but maybe China was too far away for him to know about yet. Uh, and he actually knew about uh, Britain. You can see Britannia and Ireland on the map, which is pretty interesting. So he must have known about these places if he never traveled there. But he lived in the middle of this map, in the middle of the Middle Earth Sea, the Mediterranean. That's why it has that name. And Alexandria is where he lived. And he traveled down to Syene. If you look at where Alexandria is, you can see Syene directly south on the way to Nubia following the Nile River. Now, just to recap what we talked about before, this is the angle change of the sun that you'll see here at our latitude in Vermont. Notice at the top it says June 21st, but actually this year the solstice is on June 20th. Not to get too fussy with details, but the solstice can occur on any day between the 20th and the 22nd. It's usually the 21st, but not always. And this year, it's on the 20th. However, you can see December 22nd, which can be the 20th or the 21st also, is down low. And that's where the sun bottoms out for us. That's winter. The top is summer. And if you look at the bottom globe, you can see how that angle changes. Now, notice that this perspective is based on a flat disk of an Earth. I hope nobody out there is a flat earther because that, well, it's long past the time that we know that the earth is round. In fact, this is a person who figured it out 2,200 years ago. So it's kind of a shame. It's almost embarrassing for our species that we still have people that think the earth is flat now when this brilliant librarian figured it out millennia ago. But anyway, let me show you something that you might have heard about or if you were Eratosthenes, you may have heard in the tales told by travelers who came to visit you, that in some parts of the Earth, the stars rise up and set uh, almost perpendicular to the horizon. That's what happens if you live close to the equator, like in sub-Saharan Africa or in South America. But if you live like in the Arctic or close to the Arctic in the North Pole, the stars seem to go around the sky and of course, if you live too far up in the Arctic, you only see the stars for half of the year during the winter. And in the summer, you don't see the stars at all because of the strange effects of the Arctic Circle. So he may have heard of these things. And then he must have realized that what's happening is not that the stars are moving in different directions for these different people, but that we're all on a different curved surface. Some of us have the stars moving this way. Some of them have them moving that way because the, the planet that we live on is not flat, but round. So, uh, sorry if this is taking a long time to explain, but I hope this is worth it because I think the revelation is, is worth the time it takes to think about this. So here is a very simplified graphic. I don't remember who created this graphic, so I can't give them credit, but this is a great, simple explanation. He traveled from Alexandria. The dot that says A in that's on the surface of the Earth in the circle, and he traveled roughly 5,000 stades now to explain what that is. That's a measurement of distance. That was the length of the Hippodrome, the ring, like the Circus Maximus in Rome, ancient Rome. I got to walk that once. And that Circus Maximus is one stayed long, and a stayed is like about 559 feet. That's 
why we call them stadiums because they surrounded the stade, which was the name of that length that they ran around. So 559 feet is one stade. 5,000 stades was known to be the distance between Alexander and Syene, and that's based on Alexander the Great's measurements, the marching armies, the conquering emperor you had precise measurements, which was important for supplying a military back then. So they had the measurements. He knew the distance. And then he noticed that when he was in Syene, the sun's rays were perpendicular to the ground, allowing the reflection of the sunlight to hit him in the face. But that never could happen in Alexandria because never is Alexandria perfectly lined up with the rays of the sun. So if you look at what he did, let me simplify this in the easiest way I can because I don't want to get into geometry, folks. But imagine if I gave you a piece of a pizza crust and you could measure that there was a curved pizza and you knew how big the crust was because you had it in your hand, but you never saw the rest of the pizza. Do you think with a ruler and some math skills like geometry that you could figure out the size of the entire pizza just by measuring the length and the curvature of your single piece of crust? If you think you can make that calculation, then you could be the Eratosthenes of pizza, okay? You would be able to see that the pizza was round and the piece that you represent is a slice. So in his mathematics, here's a better diagram, perhaps that'll make it more plain. He saw that in Alexandria on the same day, the solstice, when the sun reflects at the bottom of a well, that on that same day, a pole, a vertical pole would make a shadow uh, that was about seven degrees, a 50th of a circle. Maybe he ran to the scrolls made by, you know, Euclid and Pythagoras and Archimedes and was like, oh, uh, 50th of a circle. Uh, let me do the numbers. I don't know what he did with no calculator, a pen and parchment, perhaps a quill. And then he ran the numbers like Katherine Johnson at NASA uh, thousands of years later. And he came up with a calculation that if you can look on the left of the screen, roughly turning the stades into miles, 24,497 miles. The actual Earth's circumference is 24,860 miles. So he was off by a couple hundred miles. And that is ancient ingenuity 2,200 years ago. So tell that to anyone who is contemplating the idea that the Earth could be flat. It was on the summer solstice that... Uh, a person who was a librarian was able to get the data and see the numbers and make a calculation that anybody can still do today. So you've got two days. If you want to make your own personal solstice calculation, you could try that. In fact, let me just show you a couple of things that might help you. Um, Cause there's other places in the world where people were very tuned in to the summer solstice. I promise we'll get to the Venus occultation before we're done, but I want to show you a different diagram now of a place in a different location in the world, not in Africa, not near the Mediterranean, but perhaps you've heard of places like Stonehenge in Britain. This is a place that's designed to line up with the angle of the summer solstice sunrise and the winter solstice sunset. And notice how perfectly the stones line up with that. Now, on that note, Many for many years at the museum, I've been teaching kids how to do this and make their own Stonehenge or Stringhenge or I don't know, Flowerhenge, if you would like, on your property by using this chart, which shows you the directions at which these things happen the winter and summer solstice. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but if you ever come see me at the Fairbanks Museum or send me an email, hyphen rubio at fairbanksmuseum.org. I will send you a copy of this, although it's only accurate for the 44 degree latitude line close to St. Johnsbury. It wouldn't be hard for you to figure out how to change it for your own latitude if you're into this kind of thing. But notice that the orange lines that say the sunrise and sunset for the summer solstice, they're not even east and west. Another way to define the summer solstice it is that is the northernmost sunrise and the northernmost sunset of the year. That's a way that an ancient person without any technology could have figured it out just by placing sticks and looking for their shadows and realizing that the sun went no further in this direction. And looking at Stonehenge, you can kind of see that that's the thinking that went into building this solar observatory. And I want to thank 
uh, my colleague at the Fairbank Museum, Mark Breen, because he taught me about another place in the world that does something very similar. And it's older than Stonehenge. It was built 5,000 years ago in Ireland. It's called Newgrange. And it is a gigantic structure made of stones and clay. And uh, according to the story, it never has leaked in 5,000 years, which is crazy under that rainy Irish climate on the Emerald Isle. But if you go there on the specific day of the summer solstice, or maybe it's the winter solstice. I'm sorry, I may get my data wrong. But the point is, this is a place that lines up with the sun on only one day of the year. And people have to queue and plan and book the reservations ahead of time for months or years to be able to see that. The light goes down this tunnel all the way down the hall, and it only does it on one day of the year. I believe it's the summer solstice, but I might be wrong. So anyway, Stonehenge is not the only place. There was even the Miami Circle discovered in downtown Miami, built by the Tequesta people long ago. That was basically the same thing as this. So all around the world, people have learned how to use the sun to know time. And there was a man who was a librarian who used the sun on the solstice to know the size of the earth. So think about how powerful all that knowledge that you can get from this particular day. Oops, sorry. Well, I'm going to stop that there because before we run out of time, in addition to the solstice coming up on June 20th, there's something that you have to watch only tomorrow morning before sunrise. And I'm going to see if I can simulate it with Stellarium here. So there's Stellarium as we had. Oh, look, I talked so long that the sun moved off the meridian. And I'm going to actually put the sun where it would be right now. There's a button on Stellarium that synchronizes you to now. It's also the eight button on your keyboard. But if I hit it there, ooh, what's that little thing to the right of the sun? That's the move. Now, that's what we're going to be looking for tomorrow morning. Let me take the meridian out of the way, give you the best view possible. And let me zoom in on that part. Step the sun, folks. It's not a thing that's smart to do, but if we look at where the moon is, check this out. There's Venus. Now, it is technically possible to see Venus during the broad daylight, but it is difficult because you're going to lose it in all the glare of the sunlight. And you could use binoculars, but I don't recommend it because if you miss Venus and hit the sun, there goes your vision. So it's dangerous. People like Galileo did it. And if you did have a telescope, let me do it for you so you don't have to hurt your eye. Another day for another story, but Venus has phases too. And it's a crescent just like the moon, but you need a telescope to see that. And that crescent phase was part of how uh, Galileo proved that Venus was going around the sun and not the earth. So that's another story for another day. But Venus, look how far it is away from the moon. But Tomorrow, at this exact same time, the moon will be oop, on the other side of Venus. Did you see that? So check this out. It's jumping. It's not really jumping. It's transitioning slowly, but we jumped one day into the future. So let me show you what's going to happen during the morning hours, because apparently New England and Eastern Canada are one of the places on the Earth perfectly situated to watch the occultation of Venus. And if you want more information on it, I recommend you go to spaceweather.com. It's the best place online to find out about events like this. I always use spaceweather.com to see what pictures of auroras people have made and meteor showers that are coming up. And this time, I want to give them credit for letting me know about this occultation that I might have missed without knowing. So the moon, Venus, let's now go through the night. I know I'm not talking about constellations. I usually do. But today is a special show because of this special celestial uh, set of events, the solstice and the occultation. But as we watch the sun set, we'll see the familiar constellations that we've been seeing since earlier in the spring, like Leo the lion and Virgo crossing center stage just as it gets dark. And the summer triangles rising in the east. And there's the scorpion. And of course, Got to remind you that we're going to have Jupiter, the sun, and Saturn, the father. Go watch my last show from last week if you want to get a little more background on that. They're going to be in the sky, but you might have to wait till 11 o'clock to see them. But let's keep up. Let's stay up and forget about the constellations for a moment. 
and stay up till right before sunrise. Remember, we saw how far the moon and Venus were. Oh, there's Mars, by the way. But here comes the early rays of the sun. And before the sun pops up, there's Venus. So let's see if we can witness what's about to happen. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm not actually pretending to be shocked. I, I'm excited about this. I'm definitely going to be getting up early to see this. Venus will be invisible when it's supposed to be super bright in the sky just as it hits the horizon. It only looks visible because of glitches in Stellarium, but when I zoom in, let's see what time we have to wait to watch Venus appear. And notice how thin the moon will look. It's like a fingernail crescent, waning crescent. And this is four o'clock in the morning. So as we go, oh, wow, how cool. By about 4.13 or just a couple minutes later, Venus should emerge from the dark limb and just to give credit where it's due, it's really the moon that's doing the majority of the moving as it slides towards the direction of the sun. And next morning, it'll be a new moon. This will not happen again. So I don't know when the next time this occultation will happen, but they know that they're rare. They only happen every few years. So don't miss this. Tomorrow morning, I want to be very clear, June 19th, Friday morning, around 4 o'clock in the morning, if you get up, you will get treated to seeing the moon and Venus do this little pas de deux, this little occultation. You can get out your Ouija board and your candles and, you know, try to make a whole ceremony out of it, perhaps, if you're that kind of person. But it is something that is worth getting out of bed to see. And then after that, you get a bright morning and an early jump on your day, and you get to be up just before the sun, and I just noticed that the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, which is a wintertime constellation, will be visible, which tells you that the sun is very close to Taurus in the sky. So, boy, oh boy, sorry. I tried to keep it to a limited number of topics, but this solstice is a once-a-year event, the summer solstice, and I want you to, to look into those things, like Eratosthenes, the librarian. That's fun to think about how people calculated the size of the Earth in a time with just shadows and quills and no calculators and no computers. It's a pretty amazing story, but also please watch that occultation. Don't miss it. It's only gonna happen tomorrow morning, right before the sun rises. So if you've been watching online, I thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, I'll see you next week after the solstice. We'll talk some more about the constellations that we're now starting to get to see at a more reasonable hour. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you for those of you who asked questions and contributed. I like it when people interact, it gets, it gets more interesting for me. But until then, just so you know, the museum, the Fairbanks Museum is going to be opening to the public on July 1st. And I'm gonna be working there doing uh, demonstrations for the public related to astronomy outdoors in a safe, socially distanced uh, manner. But that also means that we'll probably stop doing our online planetarium shows because we'll want you to come in and see us in person. However, there will be no planetarium shows in the actual Lyman Spitzer Jr. Planetarium this summer. Just so you know, it's a sad thing, but that room is just impossible to make completely safe in this time of a pandemic. But we will be doing something similar outside in the safety of fresh air on the porch. So I'll see you there. And I'll see you next week for our last online planetarium show for this summer. So thanks for watching. And as always, keep looking up.